So, if you are watching this video, you have probably heard the fate of Arecibo. The world's largest radar telescope is about to collapse, but they're probably going to destroy it manually so that it doesn't collapse in an uncontrolled way. I saw this headline on the news last Thursday while I was at work, and then I sort of came home and dejectedly watched Contact for like the 50th time. But I don't want this video to be depressing. I want to talk about the awesome things that Arecibo was capable of that most telescopes, even most radio telescopes, can't do. Arecibo was a planetary radar system, and today I'm going to explain to you exactly how that works. How do you take a picture of an asteroid using a microwave generator, an antenna, and a big hole in the ground? When you try to take a picture with a normal optical camera, what you're basically doing is using a lens or a mirror to focus light onto a sensor, and that sensor is covered in pixels. Physical pixels, like discrete parts of a chip. This makes an image because light coming from different locations gets focused onto a different part of the sensor and hits a different physical pixel, and then each one of those pixel values gets read out and displayed as pixels on a screen. But that is not how radar telescopes take pictures of asteroids. Radar, before it was sort of a word, was originally an acronym for radio detection and ranging. And at its most basic, radar just tells you how far away a thing is. You send a pulse of radio waves out, and eventually that radio wave hits something and scatters. Some of that faint remnant echo of the original beam makes it back to the radar dish, where it's detected. Because radio waves travel at the speed of light, it's easy to calculate the distance to the thing, whatever it was, that your radio waves bounced off of. But that's just a distance. It's one number. It's not like a picture. The simplest way to take a picture of sorts with a radar setup is to point the beam in a whole bunch of different directions and record all the distances. If you mount a radar on a swivel, take a distance reading, rotate it, take a distance reading, rotate it, and so on, that's how the classic air traffic control sort of boop, boop, like radar system works. You basically just unwrap this graph into a circle and it tells you the distance to the closest thing in every direction. Not quite enough information. But there's one more thing that we need to know about light, the Doppler effect. You may have heard of Doppler radar because this is a pretty standard technique. Basically, if you shine a light at something that's moving, and that light bounces back towards you, it comes back at a slightly different color. If the object is moving towards you, then the light that you see is blue shifted. It comes back at a shorter wavelength. But if that object is moving away from you, then the light comes back red shifted with a longer wavelength. That's how radar speed guns work. They shoot radio waves of a very specific frequency. And when those radio waves come back, they have a slightly different wavelength telling the operator the relative speed of the observer and the target with great precision. So how does Arecibo work? Well, the first thing to notice is that on most radar systems, you have a big dish and you aim that dish. But Arecibo is literally built into a hole in the ground. You can't move the primary mirror. That isn't to say that you can't actually aim the telescope. Instead of moving the primary mirror, Arecibo moves the focal point. To make sense of this, I've mounted a big lens on a tripod, and that lens can't move. Theoretically, this lens is projecting a huge image back here, but normally we only put the camera directly behind it. But there's nothing stopping us from moving the camera around and looking through the lens from a different angle. That's exactly how Arecibo aims. This big thing suspended on cables moves around, effectively sampling different parts of a big image of the sky that the main dish is sort of projecting into the air above the valley. Using this technique, Arecibo can sort of tilt about 20 degrees in any direction. So you can get like a 40 degree cone of sky that can be imaged at any moment. And considering that Earth spins, you actually get a huge swath of the available sky that can be imaged by Arecibo. The fact that the dish doesn't move doesn't mean that it only gets to look at one thing. So if we can aim the telescope, why not just use a raster method to swing the beam back and forth across the asteroid, measuring all of the distances and take a picture of it that way? Unfortunately, that doesn't work. The beam is just way too huge. By the time a radar beam from Arecibo reaches twice the distance of the moon, the beam is 450 kilometers wide, 
which is way bigger than any asteroid. I've joked previously on this channel about how you can't use flash photography for the night sky. You can't use a camera flash the way you would in a dark room to illuminate something like the Milky Way because you'll be waiting for that light to come back for thousands of years. But that's actually precisely what a planetary radar system does. The asteroids aren't too far away, so you can shine light on them and wait for that light to return. Especially because the ones that are really close are the ones that we care about the most. Arecibo uses two massive amplifiers called klystrons to generate a one megawatt continuous wave radio beam that it shoots into the sky at its target. That's enough power for 800 average American homes. That is one serious camera flash. All of this radio wavelength light is emitted from the suspended structure out into the dish, which aims that blast of radio waves towards an asteroid. The target asteroid is bathed in radio waves because the beam is just so enormous that it illuminates the whole thing at once. And some of that light that bounces off the asteroid is reflected back to the telescope. So by measuring the round trip time for that light, you can measure exactly how far away the asteroid is. And the wavelength of the returning light will tell you exactly how fast the asteroid is moving towards us or away from us at that moment. So now instead of just a dot on a, on a spinning screen, we now have a dot with a little bit of a vector on it because we can use the Doppler effect to measure how fast the asteroid is moving. But it's still not a picture. The big leap that we need to make here is that asteroids are lumpy conglomerations of dust and boulders that spin and they're not just perfect idealized mirrors floating in space. Not all of the light that we send to that asteroid scatters back from the exact same spot. If you send a quick pulse of radio waves towards an asteroid, some of those radio waves are going to bounce off the front and start heading home just a little bit earlier than the radio waves that hit farther back. This shows up as a broadening of the radio echo. If you had a returning signal that looked like this, with a really powerful echo and then a fainter echo, you could imagine trying to reconstruct what this asteroid looked like as a sphere with a bright spot on the front. The first radio waves reflected by the asteroid were reflected strongly, but the radio waves that came back later were dimmer. If you had some crazy time varying signal, you're effectively plotting the distance away from you versus reflectivity. And you could imagine painting the asteroid concentrically with your data telling you exactly how to draw some sort of weird bullseye pattern on the surface. But a bullseye is not a full picture of an asteroid. We still need more information. And this is where the Doppler effect comes in. A minute ago, I said that asteroids are lumpy conglomerations of dust and boulders that spin, and that's right, they spin. Light coming back from this edge of the asteroid is gonna come back bluer than the light coming back from the other side of the asteroid. Because, relatively speaking, one side of the asteroid is spinning towards us while the other half of the asteroid is spinning away. The only component of the asteroid's velocity that matters is the velocity towards Earth. So in the middle, you're actually measuring the motion of the asteroid. But if you look to either side, you're measuring spin. If you take the returning radar signal from the asteroid and you split it by wavelength, you could imagine getting two graphs like this. If you send out a single pulse and it comes back as two different frequencies. In this case, the shorter wavelength peak is lower. So you could imagine that the half of the asteroid rotating towards you was dimmer and the half of the asteroid moving away from you was brighter, was more reflective for radio waves. In fact, if you can split the return signal into a whole bunch of wavelengths, you can imagine painting your asteroid with vertical stripes, correlating the speed of that part of the asteroid with the reflectivity. But again, stripes alone are not a full picture of an asteroid. If we want to be able to photograph an asteroid and get, you know, actually two-dimensional resolved image data, we need to use time delay and Doppler shift to build this image. Every spot here is unique. This particular point reflects light back to the telescope with a particular time delay and a particular Doppler shift. If you move to the left, right, up, or down, then every one of those regions on the asteroid surface is going to have a different characteristic time delay, as in it's a different distance from the observer, and a different characteristic color upon return, effectively, because some parts of the asteroid are moving towards us faster than others. 
It's common for these data sets to actually just be plotted with respect to Doppler shift and time delay. This isn't literally a picture of an asteroid, but a graph of when certain signals reach the antenna and what color they were when they got there. And it always results in something that looks kind of like a picture if you happen to be looking down on the rotational pole of the asteroid. It takes a little bit of math to transform this raw Doppler image into a regular XY map or even into a 3D reconstructed model. For any blip in the data, you can say exactly where that light came from on the asteroid. Or can you? The astute observer may have noticed the one problem with this plan. This spot is a certain distance to the observer and is moving towards the observer with their specific speed. And so is this point. These two sites are not unique. Delayed Doppler imaging can give you extremely precise maps of spinning bodies in space, but every map it gives you is the combination of the northern and southern hemispheres. A map of the Earth taken by planetary radar on Mars might look like this. It's called North-South Ambiguity, and it's really kind of weird. That said, these images of asteroids taken by radar telescopes like Arecibo are extraordinarily valuable to researchers who study asteroids, how they spin, what they're made of, what they look like, how they formed, and whether or not they're gonna hit us in the future. Earth-based light telescopes see asteroids as little bright specks, not as the tumbling chunks of dust and rocks that they actually are. The size, shape, and spin of an asteroid are actually very important to determining what its long-term orbit is going to look like and predicting where it's going to go and predicting what would happen if it were to land on Earth. I've previously made videos about my dad who looks for asteroids as an amateur. He's not out there discovering new asteroids, but he's actually helped refine orbits on relatively unknown objects a handful of times. And frankly, the fact that it's possible for an amateur to help refine asteroid orbits is terrifying. Asteroid impacts are commonly referred to as the only preventable natural disaster. Our first real attempt at this as a species, the dual asteroid redirection test, is launching out of Vandenberg just up the road next year. Comet Neowise from earlier this summer that a lot of you probably remember was actually named after the orbiting telescope that discovered it. I had some fun with this and was able to catch them both in the same picture. You can see it if you really squint. But this is only one probe and it was basically brought out of retirement to look for asteroids. We shouldn't be discovering new near-Earth objects all the time. We should have them cataloged. We should have such an army of space-based telescopes looking for asteroids all over the place that we know exactly where they all are and we know exactly their orbits so that if one of them is going to hit us, we can do something about it. We also need radar telescopes like Arecibo at latitudes all across the globe so that we can look in all directions and study these asteroids in detail and find out what they're made of and what they look like and how they're spinning because all of these things are going to impact our ability to handle them if they turn into a threat. And the penalty for failure is really significant. Hey, Johnny, what do you make of this? Oh, you can make a hat? You can make a brooch? You can make... Oh, wait a minute. You mean the radar? Oh, that's probably an asteroid headed this way. Hey guys, should we talk about sending the deflection mission? Nah, this thing doesn't give us a very good picture. It'll probably miss.